Welcome to tonight's Tanya class, and I got to tell you, I'm very excited about tonight's class, and I'll tell you why. Because in doing research for this class, preparing the class, I learned something which I never knew, and that is that the Rebbe's father, who was a Kabbalist, a what? He was a Kabbalist. The Rebbe's okay, father, who was a Kabbalist, famous Kabbalist, wrote many books in Kabbalah. He instructed his son, the Rebbe, on the day of his wedding, to study this chapter of Tanya. And this is the chapter. This is the chapter. So if the Rebbe's father instructed him to study this chapter on the day of his wedding, and we know the day of wedding is a very, very powerful and important day, and the Rebbe studied this chapter on the day of his wedding, out of all things he could have studied, right? This vast amount of libraries of books to study Tanya, and specifically this chapter, there must be a nice treasure, right? Yeah. Otherwise, why would he tell him to study it? So I think that that should add excitement to the class, knowing that there's some major treasure. Now, the truth is there really is. Um, when you study the chapter, now you'll see what, why, perhaps, uh, at least from our perspective, because he didn't give a reason, but you might understand why he instructed him to study this chapter, and that's as follows. In the introduction to Tanya, the author in the cover page writes the reason why he's writing the book. And he writes over there, I'm going to teach you how to serve God yeah. with love and awe. That means to really be, have a great a loving relationship with God, not a functional, functional is important too, but more of a loving relationship with God, to be in awe, your emotions should be connected, and you might think, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this, it's huge, and he says, no, no, and he bases on a verse in the Torah, that's, this is very, very easy to you, so this chapter, the author says, and we've started to discuss already several chapters ago, this is the culmination, and today we're going to learn how each and every one of us can serve God with love and awe very easy. We all want easy. Who doesn't want easy, right? So several chapters ago, the altar was started and said, you know, you do it by meditation. And meditation, we know, is not easy. You have to, you have to, you have to study. You have to, what to meditate. You have to actually meditate. So then the altar was said, oh, there's something else. We all have a love for God. But the problem is, sometimes it's covered up. That's right. It's covered up. So the last few chapters, we spoke about the whole idea of oneness of God. Here, the author ties it all together. And he says, I'm going to teach you today how you can serve God with love and awe that's easy. Wow. Isn't that exciting if we can learn that? Can you imagine all day long from the morning to the night, you're in a loving relationship with God, but in a real passionate loving relationship with God. And you're in awe of God, and it's easy to do that. And you have to realize God is a... He has a big list. If you want to have a relationship with God, guess what? Get, get online. <laughs> get in line, not online, in line. I mean to say is you have 248 positive commandments you got to do. 365 you can transgress. It addresses every issue from when, the, from when you wake up till you go to sleep. Throughout the week, throughout the month, throughout the year. But we can do this in a loving way. And this is what we're going to learn today. So the author explains how we can do this, and he says as follows. The reality is, every single Jew, no matter what level of observance or commitment to Judaism, when you push them against the wall and say, hey, are you with God or not? Guess who they're with? With God. With God. Nobody will say, I'm not with God. Up to the point, <clears throat> and we know millions went to the gas chambers this way, if you say, listen, if you say that you have nothing to do with God, you don't believe in God, I'll let you free. Otherwise, I'm going to kill you. What is every Jew going to do? Without exception, kill me. In Hebrew, it's called Mesirat Nefesh. He's willing to sacrifice his life for God. In English, it's called, you put against the wall. And that is clear. That's not even a question. So the author says, one second, why would you do that? Is that logical? Is that, is that logical? Because you can make a logical calculation. Let me say, eh, you know what? I don't believe in God. I have nothing to do with God. This way, I'll stay alive. And when the smoke clears, I'm back on track. And I'll Continue serving God. So if you make a logical calculation, you might actually 
Transgress whatever they're asking you to do. And the answer is, why wouldn't anyone do it? Because it's not a logical thing. It's not a one plus one, two. It's not something which makes sense or doesn't make sense. It's a sole commitment that nobody wants to get disconnected from its source. And the minute you put someone against the wall, he will go and self-sacrifice, Mr. it now and he's saying, I'm not interested. Logically, not logically, shalom, welcome, come have a seat. Here, either side. Not, not Makes sense, it doesn't make sense, it's not a logical thing. A Jew does not want to be disconnected from God. And think about it, look through history, and look at your own life. If someone put you against the wall, you say, no, no, no. I'm willing to negotiate in everything, but not what? Not with God. So the author says, take this logic, or this irrational logic, and now we're going to apply it to all the other areas of your life. So in other words, and he starts. Let's start with the um, 365 negative commandments. God says, don't do this, don't do that. Again, the whole list. 365, you shouldn't do. Now the reality is, why do many of us transgress whether it's one, two, five, ten, a hundred, right? it's irrelevant the number. Why do we transgress those? If we don't want to be disconnected from God, and by transgressing something which God told you, please don't do that, so you're, when you actually go do that, you're, trans- you're disconnecting from God. Why would we do that? And as we discussed last week, and maybe the week before as well, um, more last week, because something which is called in Hebrew, ruach shtus, in other words, the, it's clouded, it's dark, so to speak, the light's off, and you don't realize and see that by transgressing, you are severing the relationship. For that moment, for that hour, for that week, whatever the time that you're going, that you're transgressing God. It's really the Ruach Shtus, it's blocked over and you don't see it. So it's almost like the light is off. So the author is very simple. So we're going to put the light on in your life, and we're going to have an awareness that just like when it comes to, God forbid, putting a, um, a block between you and God, you're willing to literally put yourself to death just to say, I'm with God. Take that and apply it to every time when it comes to one of the 365 negatives, and even when it's small or big, but to realize that anytime you transgress one of the 365 negative commandments, you are disconnecting with God. Guess what? You're not going to do it. Why? Very simple. Because on a scale from 1 to 10, let's say someone says to you, hey, are you with God? Otherwise, I'm going to kill you. Kill me. I'm with God. So on a scale from 1 to 10, if God forbid somebody kill you, whether they use a knife or a gun or you're beaten, whatever it may be how people put people to death, what's the pain in, in the death process? 1 to 10. You're, not, you're going to be with God. There's no, no, no. Death. I'm talking that when someone, God forbid, kills you because you're sticking with God, what kind of physical pain is there? One to ten? None. None. Ten plus. But someone I mean, someone murders someone, right? Someone murders no, someone. I mean, you're, dead. you're dead. There's no more pain. That's after you're dead. He's talking about... After you're dead. But if so, while someone is try, trying to kill you or He's killing you... First. Huh? Getting stabbed hurts. Getting stabbed hurts, exactly. Well, you have to pick the mode of death. I mean, it could be... Irrelevant the mode, irrelevant the mode, there's intense pain. Now, whether it's for two seconds, or the the pain, depending on what type of death it is, whether it's two seconds, a minute, an hour, or hours, it could be be tortured to death too, right? As many Jews, unfortunately, were. The pain from one to ten is ten plus. Whatever the plus is, right? And it's like off the charts. Now, intense pain. But think about it. You're willing to go through that pain. Why? Because I am not going to disconnect myself from God. You will take intense pain, 10 plus. Wow. What's the logic? There is no logic. Because I am not disconnecting with God. We are not disconnecting from God. Therefore, pain, 10 plus or 100 plus, it doesn't make a difference. That doesn't come into the equation. It's not a logical thing. So look, you're a hero. You are willing to take pain which you would never normally take just because you're only disconnected. So the author says, let me ask you a question. Let's say you're confronted with a temptation for desire to, to go against any one of the 365 commandments. So whether, for example, whether it's eating something non-kosher or a forbidden relationship 
or maybe Shabbat, something about Shabbat. And again, there's 365 negative commandments. So there's plenty to go down the list. So obviously, there's a certain enjoyment in transgressing, otherwise you wouldn't transgress. Now, if I tell you don't transgress, so obviously not only is that you're not going to get the enjoyment of doing that free thing that you wanted to do, that you think is free, you're also going to experience some pain. If I tell you don't, let's say for example you wanted to eat something which wasn't kosher, and I say don't eat it. Now you were looking forward to this, whatever it may be, right? Now, so not only you're not going to have that enjoyment, but you're going to have like pain, right, for having to resist. So the author says very simple, oh, you know, I got it, painful, right? Because you wanted to do something, and now, you, now you're going to have to hold back from doing it, which is pain. From 1 to 10, what do you think it is? Now remember, death is 10. So what do you think resisting some kind of temptation? Just one. Just one? Three. A three for you, okay. Six. A six, okay, you must have something good in mind. Okay, that's fine. Yes? Oh, yeah, I was just thinking of something good to eat. Whatever, whatever it may be, that's fine. That's fine. What? Give, uh, give throw a number. Could be a seven. Could be a seven. Okay, there we go. We have some. <laughs> okay, I'm, 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 I'm okay with that. It could be a seven. I got it. One to one to ten. Three to six. Okay, I got it. So we have anywhere from one, right? Three to six, the four, and six and seven. I got it. Nobody got past seven. Okay. Now look at this. For a ten, it was not even negotiable. In a flash, I'm not doing it. Ten plus. Ten plus. Here, we barely got to six and seven, right? We barely got to six and seven. Most people were under, under, under the five, right? Close to three to one. Um, I didn't ask you. You're going to bring the average down, right? <laughs> okay, oh, you're going to bring it up. All right, the point is, the point is, the optimist is very simple. When it comes to any one of the 365 commandments, the pain is not great. So why can't you resist that pain? If you can handle pain, if you're willing to take pain of a 10 plus, so why can't you handle the plane of a one for sure you can handle, right? Three, three to six, six or seven, you can handle that. I'm not saying it's not painful. Yes, it's painful whether it's a one or a three or a six or a seven, but it's something you can handle. So since it's something you can handle, handle it. What's the problem? The problem is the author says very simple because you're focusing on the pain. You're not focusing on the fact that you're disconnecting with God. See, when someone puts you against the wall, hey, are you willing to denounce God or not? So what are you focusing on? I'm not willing to disconnect from God. Now, pain could be intense, but you don't care about the pain, because the focus is on disconnect. When I tell you, don't do that, what are you focusing on right now? On the pain. So because you're just focusing on the pain, that whether it's a one or a three, it becomes unbearable, because you're just focusing on the pain. When I say to you, no. Don't do that, not because I, don't, I want you to have pain, because I don't want you to be disconnected from God, and you don't want to be disconnected from God. And I say, shift to your thing. Do you want to be disconnected from God? And you say, absolutely not. Yeah. And don't do it. That also becomes easy. See, it's a, it's a shift in perspective. When it's life and death, hey, are you with God? Are you going to be, put, we're going to put you to dead? I'm with God. Put to dead. So even though the pain is huge, I'm not focusing on that part, because the, the disconnection from God is so important to me that I'm not... It doesn't make a difference what level the pain is. Versus, where is the ruach stus? Where is the covering up? When you, when you don't realize the disconnection and you're focusing on, I don't want the pain. I'm going to have it. I'm going to go do it. Correct. Now there's a shift. Think about any time, God forbid, one of the issues of 365 com uh, negative commandments come up, say, is this giving me a disconnection from God? I'm not doing it. Why? What? Not negotiable. Anything that disconnects me from God, I'm not doing it. So what happens now? Anytime there's one of the 365 commandments on the table, what are you thinking about? You could have it or you can't have it, or you think about it, am I disconnected from God or not? Very simple. If you think about whether you could or you can't, you're in trouble, because that's a real struggle. And you're going to be thinking about whether it's a one, three, five, six, or seven, you're going to be thinking of the pain, and you're going to be a hard time to resist. But if you think, disconnect from God, no. You don't even, you don't even engage in it. If it's disconnection from God, there's no engagement into a discussion or a feeling whether what level it is. So notice the algorithm says, based on this, guess what? It's easy. Why? Because what am I focusing on? I don't want to be disconnected from God. 
And as long as I'm focusing, I don't want to be disconnected from God, guess what? You won't be disconnected. And the 365 negative will come easy. So that is on the negative commandments. Let's bring it over to the positive commandments. So here we have 248 positive commandments. Now the reality is like this. The commandments that God gave us, we're meant to do and enjoy them. Now, the 248 positive commandments are all stuff that we need to do. And not only that, because it's stuff that we have to do, and we are human beings, and one of the features that we have is, because we're created from, you know, we're created from four elements, fire, air, water, and earth. And we know fire goes up, right? Water is taste, uh, for taste, ear, right? Spirit. And we have one element that we're all created out of, and that is called earth, right? We're all made out of earth. Now, because we're made out of earth, it created a certain thing in our DNA, our personality, our, our being, and that's what the author will discuss in the beginning of Tanya, and that is the attribute of what? Absolute. Absolute in English means what? To be lazy. So every one of us have a default setting. It's, that's our DNA. We're created from Earth. Earth, what is Earth? It sits on the ground. You ever see Earth moving? Guess what? There's a part of us that don't want to move. You get up in the morning, right? Snooze, right? Or you don't even set the alarm clock to begin with? That's the Earth part in us. That is the Earth part in us. That is the laziness in us. So we, by not, all, not the whole part of us, but there's a part of us, one-fourth, and again, made out of four elements, but one-fourth, and every, everyone is different, and so on and so forth, but the point is that there is a component in us that's lazy. So if I tell you, do a mitzvah, so what am I up against? The laziness that we have. Because doing a mitzvah means I have to go do the mitzvah. Guess what? It's naturally easier because of the concept of earth to sit in the couch or sit in the chair and just like flip some channels but not do anything. Entertain me. Do it for me, right? So God says, do this. Do this. And he has a long list. 248 positive commandments. Now, what's stopping us from doing it? Simple. We're lazy. We're not bad people. Well, some people maybe, but let's say we're not bad, we're good people. We want to do anything, but guess what? We're fighting our nature, we're lazy. So in order for us, for example, to do a mitzvah, let's take for example studying Torah, right? Studying Torah is a positive commandment, and when do you have to study Torah? 24-7. Unless you have an exemption, you're busy doing something else productive. Um, wearing tefillin, uh, Shabbat, uh, mezuzah, whatever it may be. This is right? 248 positive commandments. But the problem is, What's the problem? Very simple. We're lazy. So it's not that we want to do something even bad. We just don't do anything. So here, whether it's prayer, right? Prayer. Prayer is work. Especially for a lazy person. Torah study is work. Giving charity is work. Helping other people, it's work. You can't say it's not. So it's easier to sit back and what? Do nothing. Sit back and do nothing. So the author says, I agree. It's, let's be honest. It's easier to sit back and do nothing. And God is coming to us and say, do this mitzvah. It requires work. It requires effort. It requires sometimes even maybe pain. Right? To get up out of the couch is painful. Correct? And to go up and do, help somebody might be very painful. Because, you know, we're selfish. We think about ourselves. That's part of the way God created us. So it's work. So the author says, Let's go back to our analogy. If God, if a human came to you and says to you, are you willing to denounce God, always I'm going to kill you? What did we say before? Hey, kill me. kill me. Pain, 1 to 10, we said it's 10 plus. Okay, the effort to do a mitzvah on a scale from 1 to 10. We're going to do this again, right? So I say, get up and do a mitzvah. Now, obviously, we're all lazy, a part of us. And obviously, we have certain mitzvahs we're happy to do, but we all have certain mitzvahs we like doing. That's the fact. It's not all of them. But let's say there's some of them that we have a hard time doing, or we have a hard time doing a lot of it. So something's stopping us, whether from learning Torah more than we... Knows. We all, let's say, for example, like learning, but up to a point. And then we say, eh, enough. Or we like praying, up to a point, and then enough. Or charity, up to a point, and then enough. Or doing other mitzvahs, helping people. So at some point, we get to the point which goes out of our comfort zone, 
What does that mean? It becomes now painful to do it. So you say, I'm stopping. So from 1 to 10, what's the level of the pain? If I say to you, do this, but you're not really in the mood of doing it. But you have to push yourself to do it. 1 to 10, how much would the pain be? Three. Three. Okay. One. I'm going five. Five. Okay, that's fine. I had a three, but now even more painful. No problem. Yes. Four. Four. Okay. Three. Three. Five. Okay. So we got anywhere from one to five. We didn't. And by the way, it's true. By the way, on the negative, it's harder than the positive, which is 100% true. So you see, so it requires effort. And from one to ten, yes, the highest we got was a five. Right? We got them at one and threes, and we got the most we got a five. All right. So now, so what do you see from here? What does the algebra say? Hold on. When it came to put yourself against the wall, mysterious nefesh, you want to go for a 10 plus, plus, out of the charts, right? A home run, out of the field, right? There's no way that ball is coming back. You're willing to do that. But when it comes to make a little effort, one, three, five, you're not willing to do it? What's the logic? Yeah. And the answer is the algorithm says very simple, like we discussed last week. Ruach Shtus. You don't realize that by not making this little effort, you're not, you, you're not connecting to God. So if you're focusing, oh my gosh, i got to do this on the effort, guess what? Whether it's a one, three, or five, that becomes your whole life and becomes so huge that you can't do it. But if you say, hold on, by me getting up right now and doing this mitzvah, am I connecting to God? Versus if I don't do it, I'm not connecting to God, so I'll be disconnected. We're God, we're connecting. Now, if it's effort, whether it's one, three, and five, big deal. Who cares about the effort? It's, it's nothing compared to giving my life for God. So the same analogy the author says works with the positive commandments. Think for a moment. Right now you have an opportunity to study Torah, pray, do a mitzvah. And yes, it's going to require effort. But this effort hails in comparison to, God forbid, dying. What's the issue? The problem is here, you're just focusing on the effort. Oh, it's so hard. No, no, no. Wrong lens. The question is very simple. Right now, you have an opportunity to connect to God and not to be disconnected. No problem. I'll do anything. Effort? Who cares about the effort? Because the focus is on the connection and disconnect. So in other words, therefore the altruist says, very, very simple, if you want, bring it back full circle, to observe all the commandments, the negative, 365, the positive, 248, and you want to observe them with love and awe for God, guess what? Focus on the fact that when you do them, you're connecting to God, and God forbid if you don't do it, you're disconnecting to God. And if you focus on the connect and disconnect, it's going to be just as easy and much easier than Mesirot Nefesh, where your life is on the line. Because, as we said, it's... A, one to five in one way, and the other way it's one to maybe six or seven. But the other way, it's much greater, much harder. So you see we're willing to do something harder. The difference is because you're focusing on the pain versus on the connect or disconnect. Now, what happens when a person focuses on the connect or disconnect? What he realizes is very, very simple. What's important to him is two things. One is that any time you connect to God via Torah, mitzvot, and prayer, A, you're, you're, you're staying connected. That's point number one. You want that connection. The key word is connection. And number two is that when you actually make the effort and you do the positive or make the effort and don't transgress the negative, not only are you connecting and staying connected, but the connection is an infinite connection because you, us, finite beings, are connecting with the infinite power of God. So when a person meditates, not only meditates, you just have that awareness. I want to be connected, and I want to be connected to the infinite power of God. Guess what happens now? It's very easy. It's very easy. So for here, the author says, hold on. Great, it's wonderful. But it's always good to know the enemy. What's the enemy? The author quote brings down from the Talmud, the Talmud says like this, that there are three mitzvot that it's very, very hard not to transgress every day. Three of them. What are the three of them? One is to think about doing a sin. Why? Very simple. 
Because we know that you can do and you cannot do. You can speak and not speak. So what's the best way not to get into trouble? Don't do anything, right? Or don't say anything, which is not easy. But it's still, you can, you can, you can be in a place of not. However, your mind is constantly working. So because your mind is constantly working, you have to be constantly directing it into good places. Because the minute you're not busy directing it, guess what happens? It's open. It's like having a computer open on the internet with no virus protection. You know how quick you're getting hacked. And they're stealing all your emails, right? But what's the point? The point is you have to have constant and consistent protection. So in other words, so because your mind is always working, so it's really, the author says you have to be like literally a policeman for your thoughts 24-7. 24-7. Now that's not easy. That's not easy. Think about it. 24-7 the mind is working, and for two minutes I wasn't paying attention. Oh my gosh, I got this erroneous thought. I saw something and all of a sudden it, it, it triggers something in me. Or somebody tried to sell you something obviously wrong. In other words, the point is that since your mind is constantly working, it's something which every single day, it's pretty tough. If you can get through a day, if you can get through a day that you did not think, I didn't say do or speak, did you not think anything inappropriate, guess what? That's a good day. That's a good day. That's issue number one, the Talmud says. Issue number two, the Talmud says, concentration in prayer. Why is that? Think about it. When you're praying, what are you doing? You're trying to develop a relationship with God. Now, prayer, there's lip service, you say the words, but prayer really is to meditate, to think. Now, what happens is, it's very, very hard to constantly think about God the whole time, as we discussed before. So, since it's hard to think, when you, let's say you sit down for, to pray for an hour, if you get in five or ten minutes of solid prayer, that's amazing. And the other, let's say another 20, 30 minutes of here and there. But there's parts that you just mind wanders. I mean, it's very, very, it's a reality, right? So that's the second thing. If you're able to pray every single day and really focus on prayer and not veer off, that was a good prayer. Now, again, the Talmud says it happens. So don't be hard on yourself. And just get back on track. The third is Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara is what? Gossip. Talmud says, if you can get by a day without gossiping, that was a good day. Now, everyone knows that's tough. Because to keep your mouth shut, not easy for many people. For everybody, according to the Talmud. A day goes by, and we all know that the laws of Lashon Hara are huge. Chafetz Chaim has a huge, in-depth, what, what, what constitutes Lashon Hara. And it really is, it, just talking about somebody else, the person not there, I mean, it's amazing how you can, in a second, transgress. And what happens is, it happens to be an enjoyable thing. People like talking, right? People like talking about other people rather than themselves, because it's much easier to talk about someone else than yourself. So you naturally fall into that trap. And literally, from the holiest and the best people, fall into a trap of Lashon Hara, and it happens to be, it literally makes them very, very ugly. Now, the Sahara works full-time to make sure we speak Lashon Hara. Now, so what happens, very simple. We know God gave us protection for everything. We have to use the protection. So what's the protection God gave us? Very simple. He gave us a mitzvah to study Torah. Now, we know every mitzvah has a set time and place. Shabbat is once a week. Kashrut is food, etc. Mezuzah is the, you know, the scroll, a certain place, a certain place on the door goes, tefillin, and so every mitzvah is defined, very specific. Tzitzit, when you wear it, what it's made out of, etc. There's one mitzvah that has no limit. Which one is that? Studying Torah. We have an obligation to study Torah when? Always. Always means when? Always, 24-7. Now, obviously, you have an exception to sleep, to go work if you need to, uh, take care of your kids, family, business, whatever it may be. But what does that mean? But that's an exemption. If you're not doing anything that's a qualified exemption, you should be busy what? Studying, studying Torah. Torah. Now, so you're sitting and studying Torah, and all of a sudden, a thought enters your mind about somebody else, and you start talking Lashon Hara. Guess what? Why are you talking Lashon Hara? Because you're not studying Torah. 
You're and when you're lashing, you're throwing lashing her. Disconnecting. You're, exactly, you're disconnecting. So what happens is, how often does it happen that we don't study Torah when we're supposed to? Often. Right? What does the author ever say? How often does it happen we don't study Torah when we're supposed to? Too often. More than once a day. Maybe more than twice, twice a day. Do the one to ten thing again? I don't want to, no, I don't want to embarrass anybody. <laughs> we'll leave that a private analogy, right? Uh, we can do that, but everyone knows that, that, that what the number is. It happens several times a day. So I'll just, oh my gosh, we got a big problem here. Because what happens is right now, when you're not studying Torah, and for sure if you're talking Lashon Hara, guess what? Are you connected at that moment? Because we are finite human beings. So if we have finite human beings with a finite time schedule, if, if, if we're connecting at this moment with God, we're connected. So it means we're studying Torah. Any moment you're studying Torah, really what you're doing is by studying Torah, when you put it in perspective, what are you doing when you study Torah? You're connecting to God. Are you doing a mitzvah? You're connecting to God. You're praying, you're connecting. Now, if there's a moment that you're not studying Torah, and not only you're not studying, you're talking Lashon Hara, guess what happened right now? You're disconnected. So, there, so there's like blocks in your day, hopefully small blocks or pebbles, right? But there's, there's spots in your day that you're disconnected from God. Oh my gosh. So God, the author says that's why in the prayer service, three times a day, we do the Shmona Esri three times a day, Shachrat Man in the Shmona Esri, one of the prayers is, we ask God, Slach Lanu, please forgive us. So the author says, forgive us, three times a day you're asking God to forgive you? I mean, you ask Him once to forgive you. So why are you asking Him a second time? You sin between Shachrat and Mincha? And you sin again between Mincha and Mairav? I mean, if you're sincere, you're asking God to forgive you once a year, once a month, once a week, once a day. Three times a day! I mean, how many times a day could you sin? And the author says, exactly. Because since, yeah. probably between Shachras and Mincha, you didn't study every minute, and you got disconnected. Let's focus on the, you got disconnected. Between Mincha and Mairav, you probably got disconnected also at some point. And between Mairav and Shachras, again, you got disconnected. So therefore, since you're getting disconnected, so we ask God, please forgive us. We're human, you know, we, I didn't do it intentionally, but my mind wanders, my mouth, you know, sometimes it has a loose tongue, so I'm asking God, forgive me. Not because I'm intentionally, but the reality is, because our mind wanders, we ask God to forgive us so that we can reconnect and start again the connection. So we do have, like even today with the best interconnections, guess what? Right? The spots where it drops. Or you have a cell phone, you have the places where the cell phone also disconnects because there's no perfect connection. We're human. We have disconnects. But guess what? Comes Mincha, God, please forgive me. And you're really sincere. You're back and you're back. And you hope you don't get no drop calls, right? You hope you don't get disconnected. Yeah, we had a few drop calls, right? A few disconnects. All right, comes Meyer of God, forgive me. We're back on track. See, what it does is two things. And when you ask God to forgive you, it's creating an awareness in yourself, A, to acknowledge the fact that you got disconnected, but also a commitment to try not to get disconnected. And that keeps on going through three times a day. And if you actually say this from restaurant and you really mean it, guess what? You'll be more aware and it will be easier for you over, to overcome not to get disconnected. Obviously, the next time you want to, unfortunately, disconnect. So knowing that will make sure that you stay connected, obviously, to God in an infinite way. Now, so ultimately, we, do, we want protection. You know, knowing the problem is great, but we want to have protection to, to have this in our consciousness, so, so that we could be totally always connected to God very easily. So the author said, that's why Moshe Rabbeinu instituted to the Jewish people, when, we, when they went into the land of Israel, until today we do it, is to say the Shema Yisrael, right, here Israel, twice a day. Twice a day. Um, so the author says, why, why did Moshe Rabbeinu instruct the Jewish people entering into the land of Israel to say Shema twice a day. The fact is we know, what does it say in, in the Shema, the beginning of the Shema, the first section of the Shema, the first line in the first paragraph, that you should love your God, right, with your whole uh, heart and soul. and soul. And so, it means even if he's willing to take your life, which basically you're, you're, you're making a statement that you're willing to go and self-sacrifice not to get disconnected from God. That's the essence of the Shema, the first, the first verse and the first paragraph, which is saying, which is saying I'm willing to connect to God and I'm, will, I'm not willing to disconnect even if it means God is going to take my soul, I will not get, get disconnected from God. So the author says, hold on a second. When the Jewish people went into the land of Israel, at that point when they conquered the land, guess what? The fear and the dread of God was all over the world. The Jewish people were so connected to God, it was unbelievable. So why did God 
why Moshe Rabbeinu instruct and say the Shema twice a day? So the author says, because Moshe Rabbeinu knew that it wasn't only about self-sacrifice of total disconnection from God, but Moshe Rabbeinu knew that in order for a Jew to not only observe all the commandments and not, God forbid, disconnect through the negative commandments, a person had to remember consciously the Shema, which says, I do not want to get disconnected from God, and I'm willing to put my life on the line. In other words, which applies to us today also. We can study and pray and do mitzvot and not transgress. But if we don't have the Shema etched in our hearts and our souls by meditating when we say it twice a day, that we are willing to sacrifice anything to be connected and God forbid not to be disconnected from God, we will not have the power to overcome the temptation, even a simple mitzvah or in a simple uh, transgression. So in other words, Moshe Rabbeinu was giving a lifelong will to each and every one of us, say the Shema twice a day. When you say the Shema, what are you to meditate? Very simple. I want a deep connection with God, and B, I didn't want this connection. And I'm willing to sacrifice my life, just like if someone was telling to me, hey, are you, are you with God or not? And I'll say, Ma'odcha. I'm totally willing to sacrifice my life just for the sake of God. And that, if you keep that in mind consciously, and you attach it to not only disconnecting from God, where God for someone wants to kill you, or unless you're willing to denounce God, but even when it comes to any one of the 248 mitzvot, or 365 negative commandments, I am willing to take the same approach that by, God forbid, not doing a mitzvah, or by transgressing one of the negative commandments, I'm disconnecting from God, then I will be able to easily, as the author writes in the beginning of Tanya, very, very easily and dear to me to be able to do all the 248 positive commandments, stay away from transgressing the 365 negative commandments, do it in a way that I love God, and I don't want to be disconnected from God. So I think to, you see here a complete picture, probably why the Rebbe's father, the Kabbalist, told his son to study this chapter on the day of his wedding. Because now, obviously, he's getting married. It's a whole new level of spirituality that he's entering in. And he wanted to reconnect him with probably one of the most important chapters in Tanya, even though everyone's important, but one of the most important chapters in Tanya, because this way it allows you to have a loving and or relationship with God that will allow you to observe every one of the 248 commandments, not to transgress any one of the 365 commandments, but done in a very, very easy way by having the awareness that by doing, or God forbid, not transgressing, I am constantly being connected and for sure not being disconnected from God. And who wants to be disconnected from God? We only want to be connected in an everlasting way.